That's what grace is for. Thanks, Brother Brady. We all need grace. So glad you're here this morning. If you have your Bibles open to the book of Psalms, right? The book of Psalms, the song book of the Bible, the book of Psalms. You're going to go just a couple weeks in Psalms, and then we'll go to Christmas messages. Doesn't the auditorium look nice? Thanks for all the folks who came and helped on Wednesday get this place ready for Christmas. I love Christmas. I love Christmas time, Christmas music, Christmas decorations, Christmas gifts, all of it. There is not a single part of Christmas that I can think of that I don't like. And uh, boy, great this morning to see everyone and some wonderful guests with us. And of course, the college students are back from college right now, many of them not going back. What a blessing to have you folks back. Thanks, college students, for being here, being faithful here on Sunday morning. We missed you. You were missed here. And if we don't remember your name, don't take it personally. All right, out of sight, out of mind. But um, no, we missed you here at First Baptist Church, and we're glad that you're off there at Bible College, wherever God has taken you, and glad you're back home. And with that, I see moms with smiling faces with their kids at home. That's a blessing, too. That's folks from out of town here as well. Book of Psalms. This morning we'll be in the third psalm this morning. Help from Psalms is the next little series, a mini-series, I'll call it, just a couple weeks. Help from Psalms. You know, the fact is, you and I need a whole lot of help in life. We don't have it figured out. We don't have all the answers. We don't have the solutions, the answers, but we've got the problems. We could take a problem poll right now, we could have a problem contest right now, and we could spend the rest of the day, go far into tomorrow, enlisting our problems. Could we not? I've mentioned before, our problem, problems are often like fishing stories. Everyone has one and they get bigger with time. That's problems. We all have problems and it is easy, it is easy to focus just on the, the problems. This morning I've entitled the message from Psalms number 3, Help. I'm feeling overwhelmed. You ever feel overwhelmed? You ever feel at wit's end? You ever feel stressed out? Boy, that's a buzzword for the last 50 years. Stress. Stress at home, stress at work, stress everywhere. Stress when you drive, stress when you don't drive. There is stress everywhere. In fact, they say that 75 to 90 percent of all Doctor visits at your primary care physicians involve stress disorders. I didn't make that number up. If I'd have made it up for the sermon, I'd say 100%. (laughs) They've said, well, what drives us to the shelves at the pharmacy but feelings of stress? Americans, they say, consume over 5 billion tranquilizers. Five, bi- five billion barbiturates and over three billion other types of Mex- uh, medicines and over 16 tons of aspirin every year to help solve stress. 16 tons of aspirin. That'll solve your stress. What a stress in our life. Where does stress come from and how can the Bible help me? You know, the Bible is supposed to be a practical book. We use it here at First Baptist Church because it is God's authoritative word. God breathed it out. He inspired his word. But it's not just supposed to be on Sunday. It's supposed to be for Monday as well and for Tuesday. And the fact is, if we're honest, all of us at times have stress in our lives. Anybody want to admit this morning you face stress at one time in your life? Come on. If not, I admire you, but I also don't envy you. I think you're a liar. (laughs) Kids have stress. Different stress than adults, right? Kids have different stress. What stresses my kids out when they're younger is what's under the bed. That's stress. Now, at 40, boy, that sounds old, at 40, I wish that was the most of my problem, what was under the bed. Because I know what's under the bed, and I can take care of those things. That's not, that's not the problem, is it, though? We all have opportunities for stress, whether you're in grade school, whether you're in college, college students. Many of you are taking exams this next week. The finals, they can add an element of stress in your life. Or you can be like some and just say, forget this, and just do whatever you want to do. And that brings a different stress in your life. Oh, but mom and dad, we have stress, stress sometimes with our children. 
Stress sometimes with jobs. Stress with finances. We're coming into Christmas time where people will begin to max out their credit cards to buy things they shouldn't buy, to afford things they can't afford, to pay off for the next six months what they should have left on the shelf. Merry Christmas. The most wonderful time of the year. All stress. But you wonder sometimes and you read your Bible, is there any help for me? And in Psalm chapter 3, I believe it'll be some help this morning when we're feeling overwhelmed. Look, please, in God's Word of Psalm chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, where David writes this psalm and pens these words to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I'm going to pause there real quick. We'll get there in the, in the message. But I love verse number five, those, those five little words, for the Lord sustained me. You've got a problem in your life. Nothing's too big for God. The Lord can sustain you just like it did for David, and he'll do it for you. Verse number six, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. That have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Lord, I pray for your help this morning. Lord, as we look at your word in Psalm the number th three. I pray that you would give us some wisdom today as we face life's problems, sometimes feeling overwhelmed. Lord, I'm so glad that we can look to you and find your sustaining grace. Lord, I pray for the service this morning. You'd help me as I speak to speak those things clearly. Help our hearts to be touched by your word. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who has a need, you'd meet that need. If anyone's here who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, that they would do that this morning. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why help from Psalms? Many of good passages throughout the Bible, but I think Psalms brings an especially, uh, especially poignant help for us, especially uh, hel helpful uh, idea to us. It's some thoughts from Psalms. Psalms brings calmness to a troubled mind and heart. As you read through the book of Psalms, which I just finished a little bit ago in my Bible reading, you often find that there are troubling thoughts, troubling mind, and sometimes a troubled heart. And the book of Psalms, through the grace of God, brings calmness to a troubled mind and a troubled heart. I encourage you, my friend, if you get nothing else this morning, if you're troubled in your heart and your mind, turn to the Bible, turn to the book of Psalms. He will sustain you. The Lord will give you, will give you calmness. He also brings focus to a wandering mind and heart. It's easy right now in this current time to have your heart and mind begin to wander. Because of the advent of media, we are now accustomed to a screen changing, I believe it is, every six to eight seconds. Something else happens. The screen changes. And yet as you look at God's Word, we don't have the barrage of lights and we don't have the, all the, the hoopla that accompanies the current media culture that we're in. If we're not careful, our focus begins to shift from God and from the stillness and from meditation to what's here, what's here, what's here. The book of Psalms brings a focus to a wandering mind. The book of Psalms brings clarity to a clouded mind. It brings reinforcement to a weakened mind. It brings comfort to a hurting mind. Right here I see David, and he is lonely and overwhelmed by life around him. If you look at the top, in my Bible it says this. It says this was a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. You remember the account where David, uh, where Absalom came in and began to steal the hearts of the children of Israel. 
Eventually, Absalom came to overthrow David, and David ran and he began to flee, and Absalom came into the castle. We'll look at some passages about that in a little bit. But David felt all alone. The country was turning against him. You think you have problems. He had a whole country against him. You think you have problems. His own son wanted to kill him. But we're not here to compare problems. We're here to get some help this morning. I want us to notice a couple things of, 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 from Psalm chapter 3 this morning. And they all relate, they all come back to where you look. First question is this, are you just looking around? When you look around, you'll find that you'll be overwhelmed by life around you. I'll be overwhelmed by life around me. David had some people trouble. That's verse number one. How are they increased that trouble me? In 2 Samuel chapter 15, we find where Absalom sent for Ahithophel. He was David's counselor. The Bible says in 2 Samuel that the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David, the Bible says, saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. They were overwhelming in number. David says, as he looked around, all around him, all he saw was a problem, and it was a big problem. When you look around, all you will see, if you're not careful, is just problems. When we begin to focus on what's around us, we will see the problems. And, oh my goodness, this is shut down. And this is lost. And this is going into a state of decay. And this is overwhelming. Life around us is overwhelming. They're overwhelming in number. But verse number two, they were overwhelming in their mission to destroy. Sometimes we get to the place that we feel that the whole world is against us. Now, we know that that's typically not true. The whole world is not against us. Because some people just don't know us. If they knew us, they'd probably be against us as well. That's where our mind goes, but the whole world is not against us. Somebody somewhere must like us, hopefully. Our spouse, hopefully. My wife just said she loves me. This is good, all right? I have a good day then. Our parents, come on, mom and dad, throw me a bone, right? They still love me, but it feels on the inside like everything is against us. The world is crashing all around us. Everyone is opposed to us. No matter what we do, we mess it up. I felt that way before. It seems that every mistake or every decision is a mistake. There are no good decisions. There are those times you feel that way that everything you do is just bad. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Sometimes it happens in the school setting and young people being principal for 12 years they come in and sometimes it feels like young people that no matter what you do you're in trouble trouble at home and trouble at school and trouble at church always in trouble and that's the way it should be no 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 i'm just kidding overwhelming i've told the, the young people that you'll know you're adult when you buy your own toilet paper once you buy your own toilet paper now you're officially an adult if you can now even buy toilet paper, you'll be even a smart adult now. First time you buy toilet paper, though, what happens? I mean, your whole life, mom and dad have supplied this for you. They supplied the good stuff. But you go to the store and you find out that good stuff's expensive. I can't afford the good stuff, so we'll try the sandpaper. Bad decision. Bad decision. Don't do it. Life will feel overwhelming, I'm telling you right now. My brother was up for Thanksgiving, my younger brother. And they were talking about this toilet paper thing. I've said this for years to young people, and he was reminding me of this, and, and now he was telling me about the toilet paper he now buys. When you're adults, you have toilet paper conversations, right? And he said, oh, no, no, J.D., oh, no, no, no. I buy the good stuff now. So, wow, not only are you an adult, all right, you now make wise decisions. But life can feel overwhelming. Life can, can feel heavy. Stress. Stress. Sometimes it's our own doing. Sometimes it's our own fault. So we made the problems ourselves. We've created the situations ourselves by our poor decisions. And sometimes we have just come into it. Sometimes it just seems like it's just showed up. And nothing we have done has brought the situation. The fact remains, life can seem overwhelming. And when we look around, and when we only look around, life will be overwhelming. It can happen when you're getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner. 
We're supposed to eat at this time, and nothing is done yet. And of course, the oven doesn't work properly, and the ingredients are not there, and there's no way. Stress, this overwhelming feeling can happen all of the time. Feeling overwhelmed. We look around. We begin to get discontent. And that's what David is saying. He said, Lord, how they've increased in number against me. They're all they're just they're piling up and piling on top of me. David is in the world's biggest dog pile. He's overwhelmed. When we look around, we will become overwhelmed with life and the problems of life. It is easy to look around. In fact, the world is filled with people who just look around. Welcome to social media. Welcome to your news organizations. You know what sells? Problems. How often do you see these articles, you know, a special angel? How often do you see the news articles, wow, they uh, pay it forward? That's a great concept, but that doesn't sell. That doesn't sell news slots and time. That doesn't cause people to click on a particular uh, advertisement. What causes people to click on things are problems. It's easy to look around, and the world is filled with people that look around at problems. But I'll go one step further. The church is filled with Christians who just look around. We can look out there all day and say, look, the unsafe people, they look around, they have problems. But let's be honest, let's turn it inside and say, listen, we're Christians. We tend to just look around. We tend to get stressed out. All the problems pile up in the day. I remember I had to change part of my habits years ago. I used to think about the church and work before I came to the office. I stopped. I found myself in the mornings waking up and thinking about the appointments I had during the day and, and then the issues I had to face and the things I had to solve. And before long, within about five minutes, I realized that no matter how the day went, I couldn't get done. So before I be, began to even drive to the church, I was already stressed out. I had to stop. I was looking around. The church is filled with people who just look around. Christians who are supposed to know better. You and I know better, but what do we look at? Here's my bank account. Here's my bills. Look around. Here's my time. Here's what I have to do. Here's what's broken on the house. Here's my tools. That's solvable. That's solvable. Just call, talk to me afterwards. We can solve that problem right away. We look around. In, in every area of life, we are prone as human beings to look around. But as Christians, we're supposed to know better. And I love the fact that David was honest in Psalm chapter 3. That he was transparent. Don't you hate a fake? Don't you hate someone who's like, oh, I'm sorry you have problems I've never faced those common problems in your life before. Oh, come on. We've all got them. Mine are obviously bigger than yours, no doubt about that. Right? But we all got them. And I'm so glad that God provided for Psalm chapter 3 because we all have them. And David is here looking around and he says, God, you got to help me because I look around and all I see are a whole lot of people. All I see are a whole lot of people who want to kill me. All I see are a whole lot of problems and I'm feeling it overwhelmed. David's looking around. But then David begins to look up. Look in the Bible with you with me if you would please in verse number 3. You see the shift in the psalm, but thou O Lord. But thou O Lord. You see David was talking about the people here, but then he says, but thou O Lord art a shield for me. My glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. David says, what I know, what I know is I had the strength of God. What I know is I have the shield of God. What I know is I have glory from God. What I know is that God will lift me up. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 21, to look up. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven and earth shall be shaken. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. 
My friend, instead of allowing life's problems to overcome you, allow the power of God to overshadow you. Overshadow you. Instead of allowing life's problems to overwhelm you, allow the power of God to overcome you and overshadow you. Look up by the word of God. Look up by godly music. Look up by encouraging friends. Look up by biblical worship. You know, coming to church causes me to look up. And coming to church helps me in my spirit. I had to pray last night with a good group of men in my office. Encourage my heart. Looking up. You know, good music. Young people did a tremendous job Tuesday night. This morning, my wife was listening to the song, I Am Blessed, the little the children sang Tuesday and playing over and over. I could hear playing over. They did a great job. I think they're going to sing in a church. I asked Miss Robinson to get that scheduled for us. A great job. But you know what? Music, godly music, encourages your heart. Boy, it starts to bring the right kind of thoughts and helps you not be overwhelmed. You know, friends, encourage your heart. Friends, just say, hey, how you doing? I'm praying for you. I challenged the, my class this morning, Sunday school. There are many needs around us right now. I'm talking about physical needs, spiritual needs here at First Baptist Church. And there's nothing that we can do except to pray. So don't neglect the most needful thing. Pray. We have access to the power of God at the throne of God. We can pray. I'm not a doctor. I can't heal anybody. I wish I could. I'm not Benny Hinn. I'm not a faith healer, though I wish I was. You say, what would you do if you're a faith healer? I'd, I'll tell you what. What wouldn't I do? But I'm not. What I am is a child of God, with a promise of God, for the provision of God, in prayer to God. Oh, we can look up. We can look up in the Word of God. I think of Psalm chapter 23, familiar psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a relationship. I shall not want. That's my supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest for me. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. He restoreth my soul. That's healing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. That's guidance for his name's sake. That's a purpose for me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that's life's challenge for me. I will fear no evil. That's assurance for me. For thou art with me. That's his faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's a shelter for me. Thou preparest a table before me, the presence of mine enemies. That's hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consecration. My cup runneth over. That's abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's a blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's security forever. That's a statement. Oh, David begins to look up. He looked up at what he knew. But then I see what David did in verse number 4. What he did, he cried unto the Lord with his voice. See the process that David took. He cried and he slept. Sometimes when life's problems seem overwhelming, it seems as if sleep Flees from us. It seems as if when we lay down at night, that's the worst time of the day. As long as we're moving and busy, we can shove the thoughts away, but when we actually lay down at night, it's when it's impossible to escape, it feels like. We toss and turn. We count sheep and get to a million. Pull out our phone and try to waste time just to escape the overwhelming sense. And David says, I cried unto the Lord. I laid me down and slept. But then he explains how that happened with what God did, for the Lord sustained me. If that was the only thing in this psalm, that would be all we would need, for the Lord sustained me. The issue is, the problem is, I try to sustain myself. I, I try to solve my own problems. Well, if I go here and do this, I can solve that. If I work this overtime, I can pay for these bills. I can get this tool and solve that problem. I'll talk to this person, deal with that problem. I, I try to sustain myself, and that never works. That's why we're in the mess we're in. But David says, for the Lord sustained me. 
You see, when you look around, you're overwhelmed. When you look up, you are overjoyed, you're, you're overcome. The late evangelist Henry Morehouse was once in very difficult circumstances. His little daughter was paralyzed. One day he came home and she was sitting in the chair. And he brought a package and he said, well, this is a package for your mother where she's at. She, his daughter replied, well, she's upstairs. And his daughter, who was paralyzed, said, well, Daddy, can I carry the package to Mom? And Henry Morehouse said, well, honey, you're, you're paralyzed. His daughter said, well, I know. I'll hold the package and you carry me and I'll give it to Mom. And taking her up in his arms, he carried her upstairs to give the package to, to her mother. And Henry said, at that moment, the Lord touched his heart. And in that trying situation, that trying that time, the problem was that he was carrying his own burden. But he realized it was truly God who was carrying him. Lift her up overhead. You see, we can look up, we can look around. But lastly, you see on your screen there now, you need to look down. You say, look down, Pastor. How? We're looking around, we're looking up. Yeah, look down. Look what David says here. I want to see where he looked. He looked down. He says this in verse number 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. O oh, rise, O oh Lord, save me. O oh, my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. You know where David looked? He looked down the road. At first he looked around at a circumstance that was overwhelmed. He looked up at the power of God, but then he looked down the road. You'll notice that he uses some of the past tense there. Lord, you have smitten. You have smitten all mine enemies. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Now, if you, if you know what happened, David's still running. All right, the situation's not done yet. This psalm wasn't spread out over a month or three months. It was the same time, but all of a sudden it clicked in David's mind. He began to look down the road. Once I trust in God, this is what will happen. Salvation belongeth under God. David found some courage. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Fear. Fear is such a detrimental tool of Satan. Such a paralyzing tool of Satan. Fear. And David says, there is no more fear because I have faith in my God. He was courage. He was strengthened by courage, by faith. In verse number 8, we see true reality. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. We have what is called virtual reality. You can put on a headset or other ways, and you can go into another place that's not planet Earth. You can be a different person. You can have different gifts and talents. And many people will jump into virtual reality to escape the problems of life. As I was preparing for this message, the thought struck me, well, too often we are all in virtual reality. We think this is real. There's also perceived reality. But there is true reality. And verse number 8 tells us what true reality is. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. No matter what we do, ultimately, salvation rests in God's hand, in His power. Salvation comes from the Almighty. There's nothing that I can do except look up and then look down the road. David had won a lot of battles. David had a lot of fights. Early on, David defeated Goliath and then began to defeat the Philistine army and Philistine uh, opposition time and time again and you wonder if David would have been tempted to fight this one all by himself see David knew he'd been stuck in a situation he looked the only place he could and that was up at God and they looked down the road at what God could do 1990 there was a lady Georgiana was her name she had just turned 42 years old she was unhappy with life unhappy with her state of life and unhappy with her physical appearance. So she began to train to run a 10K, 6.2 miles. I've run a few of those myself. Nothing to it. You just run, then you stop. Sometimes you stop in the race, sometimes you stop on the ground. Either way, eventually you stop. 
To be in a train to run a, a 10K having never run before, never running a, run a race before. They have these programs called Couch to 10K, Couch to 5K. I don't know if she used that one, but she used something like that in 1990 and began to train. And she's all excited for the race. She got there to Cleveland and got to the starting line and, and jumped there. And everyone was lining up and the anticipation, the excitement, and the, the, the starting gun went off. She began to ran, run the race, this 10K. Her account, about four miles in, she asked someone she was running alongside, well, are we about to turn around? Most 10K races go out about three miles and then loop back around. The person next to her looked at her rather strangely. She couldn't figure out why. Until someone else there said, you know we're running another 22 miles. This race in Cleveland like many races do, had multiple starts. She had not started at the 5K start. She had not started at the 10K start. She had not started at the half marathon start. She actually began with the marathon run, 26.2 miles. Well, she did what any sane person would do. She kept on going and kept on going. And 22.2 miles later, she crossed the finish line, having never run a single race before in her life, having never run over eight miles, period, in her life, having run her first, and I'm guessing only, marathon. <laughs> they asked her afterwards when they found out some things about that. What went through her mind? She had this profound statement this is not the race I trained for. <laughs> There's a lot in that statement right there. This is not the race that I trained for. She went on, this is not the race that I entered in. There's a lot right there. But she finished, this is not the race I trained for. This is not the race I entered, but for better or worse, this is the race that I am in. In my life, in your life, sometimes we're going to feel, Lord, this is not what I trained for. Lord, this is not what I know. I remember I was youth pastor here. I've been here just a little bit of time, maybe two and a half months. Teenager comes to my office, school year starts with a major problem. I remember the first thought that struck my mind they never taught me in college about this. I did the only thing a good youth pastor can do. I went right down to Pastor Lett's office. I said, Pastor, you've got to help me. This is not the race I trained for. This is not the race I entered. There are some times in life that what we're in is not what we tried to be in. But for better or for worse, this is the race that I'm in. And my friend, you may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like the whole world is against you. And they may be. But quit looking around. Start looking up. And with God's help, you can look down. And you can see that salvation belongs unto God. Where are you looking this morning? If you're overwhelmed, you're looking around. If you're stressed out, you're looking over here. Where are you looking this morning? Help from Psalms. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word. Lord, it brings help to us in hard times. Lord, I pray that as we look to your word, you'd bring comfort to us. You'd bring the strength we need as we find our hope in you. And my friend, you're here this morning. Maybe you're online as well. I wonder if today God touched your heart. If you're looking here, looking around, who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. I'm looking around. Would you pray for me? I would need to be reminded to look back up. Who would say, that's me? Hands all over. Amen. I'm looking around. Who else? Would you pray for me? I've been looking around. I wonder if you're here this morning. You would say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever trusted Christ as my Savior. I'd like to know. Would you pray for me when you pray with the others or pray for the others? 
We'd love to pray for you this morning. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure from God's word how you can go to heaven. I wonder who else would say with these others, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me that I could get that settled today? Just lift your hand up, slip back down. Call no more attention to you than anyone else. Lord, you've seen these hands. You know the hearts. You know the needs. Lord, help us to respond to you. Lord, may we keep our eyes on you and look up and not around. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name.